My life can feel sometimes like it's fallen apart. This world sometimes can feel like it's fallen apart. Relationships, families, churches, nations can feel like they're falling apart. I don't see Jesus on the surface when in fact he's actually there. Well, welcome and thank you for joining us during this half hour teaching ministry through Bel Air Church. You know, as a church family, we've been faithfully and desiring to faithfully follow Jesus for 68 years. And when we talk about following Jesus, it's so important to have an accurate perspective of who Jesus is. Now, I've been a pastor here at Bel Air for 10 years in pastoral ministry for 20 years, and there's been a consistent theme during that time, but also in my own faith journey where people can prefer the New Testament over the Old Testament. I hear so frequently, and even when I was younger, I used to say, gosh, I really like the God of the New Testament so much better than the God of the Old Testament. And I like Jesus a lot more, and I would find Jesus at the time, and people would find Jesus at the time exclusively in the New Testament. However, there is this rich and dynamic truth that Jesus is found on every single page of the Bible. And when I say the Bible, I don't mean just the New Testament. I mean the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament as well. And so in this sermon series that we're launching today, we're gonna to talk about and explore biblical encounters with Jesus in the Old Testament. This will revolutionize not only your view of Jesus and how magnificent and majestic he is, but also it'll transform your reading of scripture. As I've encountered Jesus throughout the Hebrew scriptures, it's completely reframed my view of God all the parts of the Old Testament that I used to really have issues with and be confused about. And really it enables me to see the full story of God's redemptive love throughout all of time. And so in this sermon series, that's gonna run for a number of weeks, we're gonna see three different things. In some ways we'll see one of the three or two of the three or all of the three. Here's what it is. We're gonna see patterns of Jesus. They are signposts, so to speak, throughout the Old Testament that point to, that pattern, that take the shape of Jesus. So war and peace, covenant, wilderness, tabernacle, temple, all these things, all these elements, all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, dripping on every page, our pictures, our patterns of Jesus. We're also gonna see, number two, promises of Jesus. We see this all the way back in the third chapter of Genesis. Some people might use the word prophecy. Some people might use the word prediction. There are all these promises of a Messiah to come, a savior to come, a redeemer to come, a king to come, unlike any other kings, and Jesus fulfills those promises. But number three, craziest of all in my mind, we actually see the literal presence of Jesus in the Old Testament, which at first might sound odd because we know of the birth of Jesus. So how could one be present before their birth? Well, we're gonna dive into that throughout this entire sermon series. And of all places, we're gonna start on page one, my Bible, likely it's page one in your Bible, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Chapter one, verse one, and we're gonna see right here, not just the pattern, not just the promise, but actually the presence of Jesus in Genesis one. All right, I'm gonna read for this uh, passage as we dive into this sermon series. I'm thrilled that you're joining us. And again, as we go through the sermon series, you can catch any of these sermons on our YouTube channel. And also know that we record our in-person preaching during our Sunday worship services, and we publish those wherever you can listen to podcasts, whether that's Spotify, whether it's iTunes uh, or Apple Podcasts, I should say. You can subscribe to Bel Air Church and listen to the same messages in a live setting. Sure, let me read for us Genesis 1, 1 through 3. It goes as follows. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, 
let there be light. And there was light. This, my friends, is the reading of God's word. And as we say every week, thanks be to God. Now, of course, as I just read this in the English, I fully acknowledge that the name Jesus is not found anywhere here in the English language. Uh, There's no reference to Messiah or Lord or Savior or Redeemer or King of Kings. Uh, No Christ is messaged here or communicated here in this passage. And so on the surface, of course, you might look at this as I did for many, many years and say, what are you talking about, Drew? Jesus is not present here in this passage. Now, this is a great point for me to make that on the surface, things are not necessarily as they seem. There is a deeper hidden truth here that isn't just true on this page and isn't just true in every page of scripture, but I think is true in every area of our life. On the surface, it might seem like either God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit is absent, not here, not present. But in actual fact, there is a hiddenness of God that is deeply moving and working behind the scenes. And so my hope is throughout this sermon series, not only will we have an enlarged view of Jesus, not only will it change our reading of the Old Testament, also known as the Hebrew Scriptures, but it'll also give us a sense and a faith that as I move throughout my everyday life with my friends and my family and my coworkers and my neighbors, as I navigate the tough things in life, that things aren't always under the surface as they seem. There's more than meets the eye. So yes, in the English, no mention of Jesus, no Messiah, no Lord, no Savior. However, as we begin to unravel and uncover the Hebrew language, again, the language of the Old Testament, and as we allow other passages of Scripture to interpret this passage of Scripture, as it's been said before, we're going to find out that there's a lot more under the hood. There's a lot more under the surface that we can find. In the beginning, when God... God in the English language is translated from a Hebrew word, Elohim. Now, Elohim is a plural word. I've brought this up in sermons before, but many of you likely aren't catching this for the uh, multiple time, but for the first time, some of you might have forgotten that I've said that or haven't known that before. But again, the word God is plural, which is really interesting because in the English, that gives the impression that it's singular. How could God be plural and yet singular? You know, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, there's a very clear definition of what's called monotheism, belief in one God, not multiple gods, not a plurality of gods like, for example, in the Hindu faith. In fact, the famous Shema, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Lord, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This revolutionary belief in the ancient world in the midst of Babylonian beliefs, in the midst of Sumerian beliefs, in the midst of Egyptian beliefs of multiple gods, it was revolutionary to think that there was one God. And yet that word for God in the Hebrew is plural. How could this be? How could God be plural and singular? How could God be many and yet one? Some people refer to this as the community of one. Christians describe this as the Holy Trinity. Now, we will get to passages in the New Testament that look back on this passage that give us a very clear picture of the members of that community and the members of that Trinity. But before we get there, let's continue on. It says, in the beginning when God, plural, created. Remember that. There is an agent of creation. There is one who is the catalyst of creation. There's one whom through all things were created. This isn't just a a random cosmic accident. This is not something that doesn't have intelligent design behind it. But the writer of Genesis says that ultimately all things were created by this Elohim, this community of one, this God. It says, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God, not just any old wind, but a wind from God, We'll uncover passages in the New Testament today that talk about who that wind from God was. It's also a member of that community of one, also a part of the Trinity. It says, when a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, this is interesting. The writer of Genesis describes 
how God, how Elohim, how this community of one creates everything is through speaking it into existence. I want you to remember that. Uh, this is not um, ordering creation. Uh, this is not uh, designing it, you know, with some other thing. It is actually the speaking of words that causes things to come into existence. And what's the first thing that God, this Elohim, this community of one, speaks into existence? Right here, verse three. Let there be light. And there was light. All right, I've, I've set us up. Now, some of you normally, likely, would still say, Drew, what's your point? There's no Jesus here. This is where it helps to have in, uh, uh, the rest of Scripture interpret Scripture. In this moment, why don't we go to uh, John chapter 1. Then we'll go to Colossians 1 after that. So we've taken a look at Genesis chapter 1. I've set the stage. The gospel writer John speaks to the same moment. Yes, in the New Testament, but speaking about the exact same moment and writes it this way. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's interesting because in Genesis 1, it says in the beginning was God. So who's right, the writer of Genesis or John, the writer of the Gospel of John? Again, it helps when we understand that the Hebrew word for God is Elohim, which is a plural word. Some theologians might call it a community of one. Christians call that the Holy Trinity. Well, John is focusing here on one member of that community, one member of that Trinity, and it says, in the beginning was the Word. Remember what I said earlier about how the way in which God created things was through speaking? What do you speak? You speak words. That was the catalyst. That was the agent of creation. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. John is saying that this word, in the Greek logos, was not only with God and wasn't only with God, but was actually with God all the way back in the beginning, described in Genesis chapter 1. Verse three, all things came into being through him. Not some things, all things came into being through him and without him, not one thing came into being. So John is focusing on one member of that community. He describes it as the word, logos, again in the Greek, who was with God, was God, all the way back in the beginning. All things were created through him. Nothing has been created outside of him. And it goes on and it says this, what has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. John is taking all of that imagery, all of that language from the Genesis account and putting that upon one member of that community and describes him as the word the Logos, but he goes on, verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. And then it goes on talking about John the Baptist who came to be a witness to the light and it picks up in verse 14 and it says this, and the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. So the gospel writer John has the audacity to say that this person, Jesus, from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, to Joseph and Mary, isn't just any other human, isn't just some rabbi, isn't just some a product of history, but an actual fact is the word become flesh, is a member of the Trinity, is a member of that community of one, is the very word, is the very agent through which God created all things because this word was with God in the beginning, was God in the beginning, and all things were created through him all the way in the beginning. So for you and I to begin to grasp this great truth that Jesus is unlike any other history figure, He's unlike any other teacher. He's unlike any other, quote, founder of a religion. That this is one who has existed for all of eternity. 
And again, when you begin to realize that in the Hebrew language, the word for God is Elohim, this plurality that is one, this community of one, it begins to help us understand that, oh my goodness, I can actually read in Genesis 1 the very presence of Jesus Christ at creation long before, however long after that, he was born in a stable to Joseph and Mary. He is referred to as the Word of God. He is the agent of creation. The Apostle Paul picks up on this as well. I want you to turn, if you have it, to Colossians chapter one. And ultimately, again, my desire isn't for us to just have this, oh, that's interesting, or some just intellectual knowledge. But again, it would expand our view of Jesus. We would begin to see that when we follow Jesus, it's not just as a great teacher, but we're following Jesus as the creator of all things, who has existed for all of eternity who is outside space and time, who lives in the eternal now. And it would change actually as we go throughout the series, how we read the Hebrew scriptures, how we read the Old Testament, that we wouldn't fear it, but we would begin to understand it in a new light. Okay, so the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter one, many years after John, writes this. This is in Colossians one, verse 15. Talking about Jesus, he says, he is the image of the invisible God. So if God is invisible, Jesus is how we see that invisible God. Again, John says, we have seen his glory. God is not visibly seen, but Jesus is. Paul says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Ready for this? This is what Genesis 1 says. This is what John 1 says. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things and in him all things hold together. I love studying the cosmos. I love astronomy. I love biology. I love uh, studying the brain. I, I, I love science in so many ways. And you've heard me say it before that in many ways, I think science is catching up with that which is already revealed in Scripture. And as we study the limits of creation, to imagine what Scripture says, that all of it, things visible and invisible, have been created by Jesus and through Jesus and actually for Jesus that the cells in my body, that every starfish and star, the sun and moon, all of it was created for the glory of Jesus, to worship Jesus. It's all about him. And it changes how I view the world around me. I can begin to not take it for granted. I can begin to really appreciate every sunrise and sunset. I begin to realize that when the trees grow up and the flowers are blooming and the, the, the birds are flying, the fish are swimming, that actually all of it has been created by Jesus and for Jesus, including me, including you. And in scripture says that all of humanity was created by this Elohim God and Jesus, the word of God, was the agent of creation. Now, if you remember when I read Genesis chapter one, it talked about the wind of God, the wind from God. Well, that's in direct reference to the Holy Spirit. We see this in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament, that the Spirit of God is often described like a rushing wind. Some passages talk about it as the breath of God. So the Elohim, to be specific, this community of one, is God the Father, you might describe it that way, God the Word, who became God the Son, and God the Spirit. The Trinity they were all present in the first couple verses of the Bible. And what this does for me, and my hope is what it does for you, is you begin to allow yourself to see Jesus present at creation, completely changes my view of Jesus. There's moments in my life where I can lose sight of the fact that Jesus is eternal. There's moments in my life that I can forget that Jesus created all things. There's moments where I forget that Jesus is in the eternal now. And I can find myself feeling like, not only do I have no idea how to handle this situation, but that Jesus really doesn't get what I'm going through. Jesus, in my mind, sometimes, and here I'm a pastor, I've been following Jesus for 24 years, 
I can forget that Jesus exists in the eternal now. I can forget that he is timeless, that he knows exactly what I'm going through, that he knows exactly what you're going through, that there's nothing that is a surprise to even Jesus. You see, and I'll just press in here a little bit. Sometimes I think that only God is all-knowing and that Jesus lived in this historical time period for 33 years. And yes, he defeated death. And yes, he rose from the grave. But I forget sometimes that he's existed for all of eternity, that he actually was the one who spoke all things into existence, the very agent of creation. All things were for Jesus and through Jesus and by Jesus. And I love this, as it says in Colossians 1.16, that he holds all things together. My life can feel sometimes like it's fallen apart. This world sometimes can feel like it's fallen apart. Relationships, families, churches, nations can feel like they're falling apart. But to see Jesus as one who has the ability to hold it all together, even when it doesn't seem like it. See, that's what's the beauty of this that I find personally in my life. Again, in the Old Testament, I don't see Jesus on the surface when in fact he's actually there. That's what we're going to discover throughout the whole series. And if that's true in the Bible, I'm realizing, gosh, that's true in my life. That's true in this church's life, in my friendships, in this city, in this nation, and around the globe. It might feel like everything's falling apart. And Jesus is present. He's there. He's holding things together. And so my hope and my prayers is that as we go on this journey together throughout Scripture, that we will have more and more encounters of Jesus in the Old Testament. Now I'm gonna give you a little preview for next week. There's this moment that we see a couple verses later where it says that God walks with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. My question for you is who is the one that is walking with them? Is it God the Father or is it God the Son? I'll leave you hanging until next week, but we'll come back to it then. Right now we've got some resources for you. Let me pray for us. And may God bless you in this journey of following Jesus, our creator and sustainer. Let's pray. Loving God, I thank you so much for being so good. I thank you that you reveal to us in the fullness of scripture that Jesus is so much more than what meets the eye. May we understand that in the early pages, the early verses, the early words of scripture, that it is talking about this Jesus that we follow, who is the head of this church and the global church. He is the word of God become flesh. He is how we see an invisible God. He's the one that creates all things for all things. He's the one that sustains us with the power of his word. Jesus, may we have an enlarged view of you, our creator and sustainer. It's in your name we pray and we say it together, amen. Friends, a reminder that every single week we give you an opportunity to give and resource the ministry of Bel Air Church. I want to speak specifically about this time of year. Right now, we call it our fourth quarter of our fiscal year that wraps up at the end of June. And during this time, as we're wrapping up our fiscal year, we project ahead to the next fiscal year and we discern and prayerfully consider which programs, which ministries, which resources we can invest in. We want to continue this broadcast. We want to continue reaching people across Los Angeles and around the globe. But we also want to be good stewards. In this season, would you prayerfully consider partnering with us? In a moment, you're going to hear ways in which you can do that. But also, would you join us in prayer during this critical season in this fourth quarter of the fiscal year that not only would we be able to make our budget, but plan faithfully for the year ahead to reach people for Jesus Christ and through them, to be part of what God is doing around the globe. May God bless you on this day. Hi friends, my name is Becca Nelson and I'm the Director of Stewardship here at Bel Air Church. On Sundays, you may see my husband and me helping with our kids and youth ministries. But most of the time, I have the privilege of serving everyone who makes a gift to Bel Air Church. I ensure you know where the greatest needs for giving are, how your gifts are making an impact, and offering support to anyone who wants to make a gift. 
Along with the rest of our staff and leaders, I also ensure your financial gifts are used to continue the many ministries at Bel Air Church as they serve both locally here in Los Angeles area and globally. Like many other churches, we are supported primarily by contributions from our congregation. So if you already give to Bel Air Church, I wanna say thank you. And if you haven't yet made a gift, but enjoy these services or have been blessed by Bel Air Church in any way, I'd like to ask you to consider making a tax deductible gift to the church. We have a variety of ways for you to do this, and you can learn all about them by going to belair.org forward slash give, or just reach out to me and I'll be happy to help you. And if you're local to Los Angeles or visiting the area, we invite you to visit our beautiful campus and join us at one of our three services at 9 a.m., which is our traditional service, 11 a.m. or 6 p.m. You can visit belair.org for more information, and we can't wait to meet you. God bless.